uh, it's to show that the new birth gives a spiritual identity. So when you are born again, there's a special uh, identity that uh, we will be um, called. So let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, 11 to 13. John chapter 1, 11 to 13. All right, let's read it all together. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which was born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The Lord had blessing upon the reading of his word. Now, you know the word being born again was uh, a concept introduced by Jesus while he was talking with Nicodemus. Uh, some people uh, uh, said that being born again is a part of a new religion or a part of a church. But uh, the word born again is a statement by Jesus Christ himself. And this man had the responsibility to teach the Jews about spiritual things. This refers to Nicodemus. If we read the uh, uh, account of the story in John chapter 3, that's the place that Nicodemus met Jesus one night because he saw that the things that Jesus performed is of God. And therefore, he wanted to know more about Jesus Christ. Now, as Jesus talked with him, Nicodemus was confused because he could not grasp the concept of being presented by Jesus. How could a grown man be born again? That is the question when uh, Nicodemus heard what Jesus said, he must be born again. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, uh, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That would be our memory verse for tonight. Let's turn to John chapter 3, verse 3. Okay, John chapter 3, verse 3. Let's read all together. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I think it's so easy to memorize, right? It's okay. Second time. John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So that would be our memory verse. Uh, why are we memorizing verses? Because along the lines, when you met some people who are asking some spiritual questions, the Holy Spirit will put into your remembrance these verses that would... Uh, uh, allow you to explain that it comes from the Word of God. So this is the question of Nicodemus. How can a man be born again when he is old? So that is uh, a physical impossibility. And Nicodemus was trying to understand a spiritual lesson through earthly understanding or earthly intellect. And Jesus clearly stated in John 3, 7, ye must be born again. Now the choice was in the hands of Nicodemus. The question is, would he be born again or would he continue his earthly way of life? So that is also our uh, answer if you will be asked, are you born again? Do you want to be born again? Or in other words, do you want to be saved? Because the word born again is similar or synonym of say having uh, eternal life or uh, redemption uh, it's just a synonym of the word uh, born again now would he be born again or would he continue his earthly way of life and the scriptures show that after the crucifixion of christ Nicodemus chose to be identified with Christ when he and Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus so they could give him a proper burial. He was so, or he was no longer afraid of what people thought. He was willing to be known as a born again believer. So there was a transition, there was a change 
in the position of Nicodemus as a religious leader, perhaps that would be a big challenge for him to identify himself for Christ. So when he was asked at this time of their conversation, probably Nicodemus just keep it into himself. So that's why we sometimes I turn that as an 007 believer. You know what is an 007? You know, J 007 is the number of James Bond. Oh, what's the work of James Bond? He's an secret. agent or secret agent. So that means a secret believer. Now Nicodemus was a secret believer or 007 believer. However, he identified himself during the time when Jesus needs to have uh, a burial place. He identified together with uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. They asked Pilate that they will take care of the body of Christ. So at this point of time, he identified himself that he is born again. Because if he's not born again, he will not show up and then you know, stand and try to uh, bring the body of Christ to be in a proper burial. Now the thought of being born again is almost as mysterious to most people today. Especially those people who don't have any biblical background, when you're going to, uh, to tell them, are you born again, you will be confused. They will be looking at you and saying, born again. Uh, I'm not born again. I'm, I'm born here. Or, or he will have or another interpretation. So they might have heard the phrase, but they are not sure what it means. Remember, the former president, uh, uh, President Jimmy Carter was running for president and he spoke of how he had been born again. So he identified himself that he is a Christian. Actually, he is a, a Sunday school teacher of a Baptist church. And few people know what he meant. And some even ridiculed him as being too religious. Because when they heard the word being born again, it is a religious term a term that is not very common to the society. So anyone who will hear that, if they are unbelievers, they will say, oh, you are just too religious of your uh, belief. Now others thought little of it. Now it means a little more to many people now. The biblical idea of being born again speaks of one's spiritual condition. What is your spiritual condition that would give you uh, a mark that you are a Christian through obtaining or saying that you are born again. Now it does not refer to church membership. It does not refer also to um, water baptism because being born again brings a believer into the family of God. It is not baptism because baptism is a picture of the death. So death and birth is two separate things. You are born into the family of God when you receive Christ as your Savior. So that's why you are born again. You are baptized, which signifies the portrait or the picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So there are some denominations who believe that born again here in the scriptures is about being baptized, being immersed in water. It does not point there at this point, at this, you know, um, at this uh, instance. Now, it is the act of being born again that will be the subject matter of this lesson. Now, first is the requirement for the Savior. What's the requirement uh, for the Savior? Now, when God, uh, when did God devise His plan of salvation? Now, some people think He ar arrived at this plan only after Adam's sin. And the work of salvation was planned in the council halls of eternity. Now in Revelation 13, 8, Jesus said, The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Remember that Adam and Eve committed sin uh, after the creation. But here, Jesus Christ was declared as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, Paul wrote about the hope of a believer as because of eternal life. And this hope and life was promised before the world began. Let's look in Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, verse uh, 2. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2.
it says here, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world begun. So you can see here that um, uh, the hope and life was promised before <laughs> the world began. And also Peter declared the planning for salvation through the shed blood of the Lamb was determined in 1 Peter 1.20. Let's look in 1 Peter 1.20. It says here that Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. See here, before the foundation of the world. Now, his gift of salvation was an eternal part of God's plan. What it entailed is a revelation of God's infinite love for the human race. And the lesson text states in John 1.1, he came unto his own. Which refers he came to the people of Israel. Now this statement shows the depth of his purpose. In the Old Testament, it revealed a principle called the kinsman redeemer. Have you uh, watched the film uh, of Ruth or the story of Ruth? This is the principle of the kinsman redeemer. What does kinsman redeemer mean? It was a law stating that if a person lost what he had through poverty or want, the property was not completely lost. Okay, that's the law. Then a kinsman redeemer could purchase it back for the family. So, um, there were some requirements for one to serve in this capacity. First, he had to be the nearest relative to have the right to redeem the possession. It means... There's really a relationship. That kinsman redeemer is related to the person who needs some help. And then he had to be the nearest relative. And the next is that the relative also had to be willing. So there's a willingness. How to be willing. And Boaz was the kinsman to Naomi and Ruth. Do you remember the story? He could have refused to do the work, but he was willing. So that means that even uh, he is uh, a relative, he must be willing. If he is not willing, then therefore it will not work out. So the Redeemer also had the means to redeem the possession. It means he has the money. He has the means that he could pay, you know, the, the person who uh, owned the property. It would do little good for a person to be a near kinsman and be willing to redeem if he did not have the financial power to purchase it back. It's just useless if they are relatives and he is willing, but he don't have money. How can he redeem it? He must have these three qualifications or requirements in order to be a kinsman redeemer. And these requirements were necessary to serve as a family's kinsman redeemer, which means that, uh, for example, I, uh, there's a piece of land uh, awarded to me. And because of some circumstances, I just sell that land. And I don't have that land anymore because it was already sold. However, I could retrie retrieve that land. But there should be a relative of mine who is willing to, to pay for that. He must have the willingness and also he must have the money. So if you don't have the money, even though you want to have the, the land back, it's not possible. So that's the requirements here. Now, because of the sinfulness of the human race, someone was needed to stand in its place to act as the Redeemer. So he had to follow the standards set by God. He could not have or not be separated from humanity and purchase this redemption. Now, this is why the scriptures declares in John 1.11, He came unto his own. He came unto his own. He became a human so he could be the redeemer. So note that Jesus must become a human being so that he could be a redeemer. He should not be an alien from another, you know, another planet and just show up and say, I will die for you. It's not an alien. 
he joined the human race in order to qualify and set the standards uh, given by God. So he became a human so he could be the redeemer. That is in Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 8. Let's look in Philippians 2. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. How important it is because many, quite many people are saying, what is that Christ needs to be become a human person like us? He can just, you know, say, you're, or you already say, because he's God. He can do it. But there's a standards that God has set. The one who will be redeemed is also from the human race. Let's look in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 8. It says here, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So you can see here, Jesus became man. He, he said, it, it, being uh, the, in the form of God, he is God, taught it not robbery to be equal with God. So Jesus Christ is God. But what happened? Here in verse 7, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. You see, he is God, but he formed into a servant and in the likeness of man. So therefore, you can see that God became flesh, became the human being. So Jesus Christ is God. He is also man. He is not half man or half God. He will be like the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, what's this? In Langilin, the mermaid, you know. The half is a woman, then the half is a fish. If that's the case of Jesus, then half human being and half God, then he will be walking without, you cannot see the half of the body because it's God and God is a spirit. So many will be afraid. He's like a ghost. But he is totally and 100% man and he is also 100% God. Now he was willing to satisfy the demands of God so all people could be saved. He also possessed the means to pay the price. No sinful human could pay the price of salvation. Jesus is the perfect, sinless Son of God. He was capable of taking the sin of the world on His back. And He went to the cross as the offering for sin so all people could be saved. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice that mankind will obtain salvation. He became man Yet, he humbled himself and died for the sins of the whole world. And it is through his blood that we will obtain everlasting life. And in 1 John 2, 2 tells us, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, John was writing to Christians about our relationship with God. Jesus has died for our sins. He paid it, but not only for us, but also for the whole world. Only He could satisfy God's requirement. He went to the cross so everyone would have the opportunity to be saved. So we are so thankful. We are so grateful because Jesus loved us so much. Because without His love, we will not have salvation. Salvation comes through Him. That's why when he was on, on, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was there praying. He said, Lord, if there's other way that man can be saved, then please do it. The God of the heavens is looking for something or someone that would replace him, but there's nobody. It should be the death of Jesus Christ. So that's why Jesus Christ said, not my will, but thy will be done. So he submit himself. It was so painful. But that's the only one, the only way that we will have a reconciliation to God the Father. Second is the rejection of the people. One would think that with the 
awesome goodness of God as shown in His willingness to send His Son to earth as the sacrifice for sin, all people would really de or readily receive the gift of eternal life. But that did not happen. Jesus came to earth as the Messiah the Jews had been longing for. And the Old Testament prophets had foretold His coming. Meticulous details had pointed to His identity. The people had been expecting Him, but were looking for someone other than Jesus. They did not want the suffering servant foretold in Isaiah 53. They wanted a conquering king. So when this man came to help them instead of mount a rebellion, they quickly rejected him. Now, if you are expecting a savior, normally you love a, a, a savior that he is so powerful that can be known throughout the world right away and should be a conquering king. The Jews were looking forward of a savior like David. David was a conqueror. He has conquered a lot of kingdoms. So that is what they expect through Jesus Christ. But Jesus did not show that, so they rejected him. Did not accept what he has done. What had Jesus done to cause the rejection? He had served them vigorously and diligently. He had healed the sick, cast out demons, freed the hungry, and taught them the way of God. That was not what they wanted. They tried to force him to become their king. So if you are in the shoes of the Jewish people at that time, you will have the same attitude. Because, you know, during the time of Christ, they were under the Roman government. Okay, it's, it was Rome who, who you know, who, uh, it's like they were colonized by, by the Roman Empire. So therefore, if you are under an, another country, you don't want to be under that another country, but you want to be liberated. You want to have your own. And this is what the Jews were looking to. A Messiah that would deliver them from, you know, from the uh, power of the Roman Empire. But it was not that so when Jesus Christ came. They tried to force him to be their king. But Jesus walked through their midst and departed. That is in... In John chapter 6, verse 15, they were forcing Christ to, to become king, but Jesus just walked in their midst. Let's look in uh, John 6, 15. It says here, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So you can just imagine people are thronging to Christ. He was performing miracles, but at the same time, their mindset is saying to themselves, we want him to be the king. So we will force him to be the king, but Jesus Christ departed. Now their rejection was complete. When was that? When they cried out in Luke 23, 21, crucify him, crucify him. They were disappointed of the actions of Christ. So they cried, crucify him, crucify him. He went to the cross and died there. So the rejection of Christ has not stopped since that day. And even today, many people still reject Jesus Christ. And he continues to offer the gift of eternal life to all people. All they have to do is what? To repent of their sins and receive him as Savior. And mankind, the human nature, don't want to accept that we are sinners. That's why they don't want to repent. That's why they don't want to receive Christ. Because to them, it's weakness. If you acknowledge that you are a sinner. But people want a plan whereby they can do good works and earn their trip to heaven. Normally, if you're talking to some people who are not Christians and who believe in God, if you ask them, how can you sure that you will go to heaven? The normal answer will be, well, I'm a good person. I have helped a lot of people. I go to church. I pray. I read the Bible. So that is their actions. That is their response when you ask them about their salvation. They will uh, boast for their good works, the good deeds that they have done. And that's the thing that they could earn their trip to heaven. They don't want to be dependent on anyone else. Now, many people want to be independent. 
And he said to themselves, I can do it with myself. Now the Jews wanted to earn heaven by their religious and sacrificial works. And it was impossible. Let's look in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. It says here, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. At that time, during the Old Testament, they used the goats and the bulls and the ships' uh, blood to, you know, as, as, as a, a means of sacrifice. But that was only a picture. That was not the real thing. The real thing is the blood of Christ that has been shed. It's the real thing that we find redemption. So the Jewish people who are observing those types of sacrifices thought what they were doing will make them to heaven. And people today want to be good enough to deserve salvation. And this also is impossible. Why? Salvation is not of works lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9. If people could earn salvation, they would boast of what they had accomplished. And they would seek personal glory for their efforts. All the glory for salvation belongs to Jesus. He paid the price and offered salvation. Now, though people continue to reject Him, still Jesus offers salvation to all people. And no one is except from his offer, but not everyone will be saved. Only those who trust in him will receive eternal life. So rejection of the Savior condemns a person to hell. That's the only reason why man will go to hell. Because he rejected <laughs> Jesus Christ. And the third is the relationship of the believer with God. The relationship of the believer with God. There is no natural relationship between God and humanity. And because of the rebellion of Adam in the Garden of Eden, every human being is an enmity with God. All are sinners and can never attain a right relationship with God by their own efforts. So how can there be a relationship with, between the perfect and holy God and sinful humans? Some people thought that if they are part of a big religious group or a big religion, then they can access to God. They can go to heaven. But it's not possible. There can be reconciliation between God and any person on the basis of that individual's willingness to receive Jesus as Savior. What does John 1.12 tell us? Let's turn to John chapter 1 verse 12. John 1 12. But as many as received him, to them did he power to be called the sons of God. That's John chapter 1, verse 12. When you receive Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you have the power to what? To become the sons of God. <laughs> That's only the time that we are uh, uh, part of the uh, forever uh, family of God and even to them that believe in his name so the believer is given power power from what to change from one family that is our human race we came into this world through our parents and then to go to another family what is that family that is the family of God so this word has the idea of legal right or authority a child physically born.